Okay. <laughs> okay. What, what I wanted all my life. Okay. I offer my obeisances and meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna, Vasudev, the personality of Godhead, by whose invincible potencies influences them, less intelligent class of men, to call me the supreme controller. Huh. It's kind of a very humble thing for Lord Brahma to say, it seems. But he's, why does he meditate upon Vasudev? Uh, because Vasudev makes people think that he's the supreme controller. So it's kind of like he's saying that that's quite an accomplishment, and the only God could do that and make them think that I am God. Purport port, port, port by Srila Prabhupada, slide number five, I think, here or something. As will be more clearly explained in the next verse, the illusory potency of the Lord bewilders the less intelligent to accept Brahmaji, or for that matter, any other person as the Supreme Lord. Brahmaji, however, refuses to be called this, and he directly offers his respectful obeisances unto Lord Vasudev, or Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, as he has already offered the same respects to him in the Brahma Samhita, 5.1. And of course that is, Ishvara Parama Krishna Sat Sat Chedananda Vigraha Anadya Adya Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. Text number slide number five, six. The Supreme Lord is the personality of Godhead Lord Sri Krishna, the primeval Lord in his transcendental body, the ultimate cause of all causes. I worship that primeval Lord Govinda. Next slide, number seven. Baba continues. Brahmaji, Brahmaji, is conscious of his actual position, and he knows how less intelligent persons, bewildered by the illusory energy of the Lord, you know, whimsically, accept, whimsically accept anyone and everyone as God. Yes. A responsible personality like Brahmaji refuses to be addressed as the Supreme Lord by his disciples or his subordinates. Yeah. The foolish persons praised by men of the nature of dogs, hogs, camels, and asses feel flattered to be addressed as the Supreme Lord. And here we have a picture of a dog with a bow tie, mortarboard hat, and diploma in his mouth. Okay. But he's still a dog. So, next slide, number eight. Baba continues. Why such persons take pleasure in being addressed as God? Or why such persons are addressed as God? by foolish admirers is explained in the following verse. So two, two times Prabhupada is referring to the following verse. And then we have a, a picture from Light of the Bhagavat, which is the, glow, the, uh, the what do you call them? Uh, lantern bugs? Fireflies. Fireflies. You know, there, and the whole purport talks about how people are deceived in Kali Yuga. And so I actually have that here on slide number, I guess it's slide number nine. Light of the Bhagavat, verse number five, Kabba especially talks about this phenomena. And he says, the evening in the rainy season is dark all around. There is no sight of the twinkling stars on the horizon or the pleasing moon. They are covered by clouds and the insignificant glowworms become prominent in the absence of the luminaries in the open sky. Next slide. <clears throat> Number 10. In the godless civilization of the age of quarrel, Papa continues in light of the Bhagavad, 
There are countless religious societies, most of them trying to banish God from religion. Glowworms want to be prominent in the absence of the sun and the stars. And these small groups following various religious conceptions are like glowworms trying to be prominent before the eyes of the ignorant mass of people. There are now a number of self-made incarnations people follow without authority of the Vedic literatures and there is regular competition between one incarnation's group and another's. And here we put a picture of ourselves as being possibly <laughs> one group. Yeah. The Vedic knowledge comes in a tradition from the spiritual master through the chain of disciplic succession. And the knowledge must be acquired through this chain without deviation. In the present age of quarrel, the chain has been broken here and there, and thus the Veda is now interpreted by unauthorized men who have no realization. So there we go. But they're still presenting the Veda, you know, and they're still uh, possibly claiming in some ways to be impara, parampara, but actually they're not authorized you know, to explain it. And they're not explained in terms of their own realization. Okay. The so-called followers of the Vedas deny the existence of God. As in the darkness of a cloudy evening, the glowworms deny the existence of the moon and stars. Saner people, saner people should not be waylaid by such unscrupulous men. Bhagavad Gita is a summary of all Vedic knowledge because it is spoken by the same personality of Godhead who imparted the Vedic knowledge into the heart of Brahma, Brahma, the first created being in the universe. Srimad Bhagavatam was especially spoken for the guidance of the people of this age, which is darkened by the cloud of ignorance. Nine. So we went on here. Now we have a picture of two... Uh, Cooies, two guinea pigs, duking it, duking it out with their boxing gloves on. And we extracted this one citation. Papa says, regular competition between one incarnation's group and another. You know? So, of course, in the, the, Christi- uh, the history of Christianity, there's been so much, you know, so much violence, you know. And pretty much thinking about it, you know, in the West the Western world, hmm, which includes a lot, all of South America, Mexico, Canada, North America, Europe, and then, practically speaking, extending in, into Russia. Russia became a uh, Christian, not to, to, you know, maybe that, maybe like the seventh century or something. And in my own research, before that, there was almost nothing in terms of written, written records. There were folk traditions and songs. So, but even into Russia and, uh, and of course, the Middle East, you know, Iran, Iraq even, then it's the same uh, one, actually one small religious group. Uh, The Jewish tradition, even the Arabic tradition, which the, you know, the uh, Arabs claim from their side, was not that extensively spread according to what we're looking at. There were many groups. And they were in the Middle East, and, and they were worshiping Al, who was related to the sun, like that. You know? And it was describing that the Jews actually possibly even picked up the monotheistic attitude from somebody else. You know? So from them, of course, Christians are followers of Jewish tradition, and they claim that Christ is born in Parampara, you know, from David. And the other side, uh, the Muslim tradition, I think it's Abraham or somebody had several sons, and one side became Arabs and one side became Jews. So they claim that Muhammad is coming from a parampara on that side. You know? But all of them, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, all claim uh, uh, Solomon. Solomon as their patriarch. You know? So it's amazing. This one religious conception is spread all over 
predominantly very large part of the world. Other people, you know, following uh, Confucius, Confucius, very prominent in China, even now, and he synthesized all the previous acharyas available at his time to generate his philosophy. He didn't create something new, really. And then uh, Socrates, and from him we get Plato and Aristotle, and that whole tradition of jnana, you know, science, you know, follows that method of, of, of analysis, of logic. You know, they have their tradition. And then Buddha, and of course Buddhism spread and spread. So it's here and there, you know, some Buddhism in India, so maybe some more Buddhism still in China, and then maybe some in Japan, Ceylon, and then here and there, you know, different places like that. And so people, so many places, you know, there, in many places then there's an agreement, you know, upon God, you know, so everybody's worshiping the same God, you know. But then it comes down to different groups. So some people want to follow Christ, and some people want to follow, you know, uh, Moses or Abraham, and some people want to follow, um, well, my my Maitis, He's the kind of the one of the most powerful Greek, I mean Jewish, acharyas, and different than Jesus. And then other one that I want to follow, um, you know, Prophet Muhammad, his may his name bless us, and and you know, people like that. You know, so there's regular competition between one incarnation's group and another's, like that. And and we see this the the, the violence and the the warfare. You know, it's so incredible. You know? But usually the, the violence and warfare is not so much based, as we know, upon you know, philosophical concepts. Those are simply like, you know, a, a bluff to cover the fact that what we're really after is land, you know, uh, cattle, you know, sense gratification in the form of beautiful wives, fine houses, comforts, like that, you know. So in Kali Yuga, people, you know, they don't understand. They, they don't understand the message of Muhammad, the message of Confucius, the message of Socrates, the message of Christ Jesus. You know. and, and because of this, then they, they, they run after pieces of broken glass, ignoring the jewels of these philosophers. And then there's not enough, and so there's competition and violence. You know. We were also wanted to... Uh, he mentioned this, of course, even in, in, in ISKCON, you know, when Prabhupada left, and even now to some degree, you see the different ISKCON gurus, you know, that I was claiming in myself to trying to take up this position. I've seen that these uh, arguments develop between the followers of this Swami and the followers of that Swami. One time Jayapataka Maharaj was in... Uh, uh, Hari Kripa, Hari Kripa in the south of Peru. And they were telling him, oh, this, you know, this Hanumat Swami's followers are like this. And uh, we, you, your, your faithful followers are like this. And he responded, he said, Hanumat Swami and I are friends. <laughs> why, why can't you be friends like that? You know, and so we are, you know, we differ, we're different people. Of course, there'll be differences, in it, and it can be healthy, should be healthy. You know? In the beginning, there may be some materialistic you know, divisions among who's, who's incarnating Prabhupada's vision better than who, who else. Okay, but we keep it under control, and by the process and by friendship, then gradually we resolve these things and then get rid of our own you know, stupid, selfish desires. So especially very practical by Maya's potency, even in our own religious society, we can we form different groups, you know, and then and try and promote our particular personality. And when Prabhupada was here, it was the same thing. You know, Guru Kripa, Tamal Krishna, you know, Prabhupada likes my pro- program big, Prabhu. <laughs> I used to hear that. Prabhu, the Prabhupada likes my program big, you know, and your, your program is useless, you know. So, yeah, so let's go on to your next slide, number 14, okay. And here we have uh, uh, Shambhav Bhagavatam 438. And this is Lord Vishnu talking to the, uh, the, 
the sons of Maharaj Parchini Barihi, Barishat, and he tells them, uh, the personality of God had said, my dear sons of the king, I am very much pleased <clears throat> by the friendly relationships among you. Ah, so what pleases Krishna? Friendly relationships amongst the kings. All of you are engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I am so pleased with your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may ask, a benediction from me, the Prabhu's purport. But since the sons of King Prachin Abarhi Shat were all united in Krishna consciousness, you know, the Lord was very pleased with them. Each and every one of the sons of King Prachin Abarhi Shat was an individual soul but they were united in offering transcendental service to the Lord. The unity of the individual souls attempting to satisfy the Supreme Lord or rendering service to the Lord is real unity. In the material world, such unity is not possible. So slide 16. Even though people may officially unite, they have different interests. In the United Nations, for instance, all the nations have, a, have their particular national ambitions, and consequently, they cannot be united. Slide 17. Their unity between individual souls is so strong within this material world that even in a society of Krishna consciousness, members sometimes appear disunited due to their having different opinions and leaning toward material things. Actually, in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be two opinions. There is only one goal, to serve Krishna to one's best ability. If there is some disagreement over service, such disagreement is to be taken as spiritual. And of course, that's a big point. You know, we hear that even at the top, highest level, there are spiritual disagreements. You know, Prabhu, I want peace. Well, you're not going to find it in the spiritual life. You know, Radharani and Chandravali are two extreme differences in how to serve Krishna. And not just that, there's also Taraka, uh, Shama, Palika, eight gopis, you know, seven more besides Radharani. And they're in between uh, Radha and uh, uh, Chandravali in terms of their Chandravali, in terms of their particular moods and humors. It's, they have different ways to serve Krishna. And this is dynamic, dynamic developing. There's no end to it. <clears throat> Prabhupada's talking about the, the verbal fights, the joking between Advaita Acharya and Lord Nityananda. And Prabhupada says that Lord Nityananda is the uh, Avaduta consciousness, and Avaitacharya is the Smarta consciousness. And he said, from the beginning of spiritual life, there has always been these two groups. So I guess uh, Rukmini's side is more Avaitacharya, yeah. and uh, in Chandravali. Yeah. But there have always been these two groups, and they've never been able to understand each other, and they never will. <laughs> like that. You know? But the thing is, when every, everybody has their space, you know, their position, then we can appreciate everybody's service. You know? Actually, practically speaking, you know, the, the gopis, Radharani is wild gopi group, you know, of violence <laughs> to Krishna, and Chandravali is peaceful, submissive, you know, shy group. They, they fit together very well, you know, like that. To, to increase the uh, the whole appreciation of how to serve Krishna and Vrindavan and Dham. You know? So the thing is to find our particular humor, position. You know? even, in, even before we're at a very profound level, still we realize our psychophysical nature gives us a certain ambience, consciousness. And as we can understand what that is and engage it in Krishna's service, serving Krishna to the best of our ability, even if there are... Uh, 
conflicts, then they're very nice. They very, very help us. They sharpen our intelligence. They motivate us to improve our service like that. And after arguments, we feel better, and we actually feel closer to the other person like that. So if we go on in this 430 purport, Thomas says, those who are actually engaged in the service of the personality of Godhead cannot be disunited in any circumstance. This makes the personality of Godhead very happy and willing to award all kinds of benedictions to his devotees as indicated in this verse. And also we have a, you know, a citation here from Madhya 19156, which is Rupa Shiksha, instructions to Rupa Goswami, Chaitanya Charitamrita. If a devotee commits an offense at the feet of a Vaishnava while cultivating the creeper of devotional service in the material world, his offense is compared to a mad elephant that uproots the creeper and breaks it. In this way, the leaves of the creeper are dried up. Okay. Kripal says, one's devotional attitude increases in the association of a Vaishnava. Tandara charana sevi bhakti sanevas janame janame hai e abhirash. By his personal example, Naratam Das Thakur stresses that a devotee must always remember to please his predecessor, Acharya. The Goswamis are, representing, are represented by one's spiritual master. One cannot be an Acharya, spiritual master, without following strictly in the disciplic succession of Acharyas. It's interesting because here the word Acharya is with a small a. Yeah. One who is actually serious about advancing in devotional service to desire only to satisfy the previous acharyas. H.I. Goshanyar Mui Taradas. This is slide 21. One should always think of oneself as a servant, of, a ser- of the servant of the acharyas. And thinking this, one should live in the society of Vaishnavas. However, if one thinks that he has become very mature, and can live separate from the association of Vaishnavas, and thus gives up all the regulative principles due to offending a Vaishnava, one's position becomes very dangerous. Offenses against the holy name are explained in Adi 8.24. We put that into our index because, you know, where is a good explanation of the ten offenses? And in different places... We have one for the second canto, but here Prophet actually picks out, you know, one explanation of where the ten offenses are explained. Giving up the regulative principles and living according to one's whims is compared to a mad elephant, which force, which by force uproots the bhakti lata and breaks it to pieces. In this way, the bhakti lata, bhakti lata cribbles up. Such an offense is especially created when disobeys the instructions of the spiritual master. So we don't actually have to even be offensive to Prabhupada. There are people who are very offensive to Prabhupada. But here, um, it's especially especially created when one disobeys the instructions of the spiritual master. Prabhupada says in this movement we require everyone to rise early by 4 a.m., attend Mangalarti or morning service, uh, perform kirtan, read Srimad Bhagavatam. So some of them chant our gayatris, uh, worship the deity according to the rules and regulations, the standard, like that. Find some practical process in in Sankirtan. So if we're not following his instructions, it's offensive. (laughs) And it especially happens when we, we give up the, the association you know, of devotees, and that way we're, we're, we're protected. That's the fence that protects us from the mad, ele- that mad elephant offense. If we go on with this purport, slide 22. This is called Guru Avajna. The devotee must therefore be very careful not to commit offenses against the spiritual master by disobeying his instructions. 
As soon as one has deviated from the instructions of the spiritual master, the uprooting of the bhakti lata begins, and gradually all the leaves dry up. In side 23, Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhulila 19157, the next text, it said, the gardener must defend the creeper by fencing it all around so that the powerful elephant of offenses may not enter. When the bhakti creeper is growing, the devotee must protect it by fencing it all around. The neophyte devotee must be protected by being surrounded by pure devotees. In this way, he will not give the maddened elephant a chance to uproot his bhakti creeper. When one associates with manan devotees, the maddened elephant is set loose. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, Asat Sangatyaga e Vaishnava Char. The first business of a Vaishnava is to give up the company of non devotees. A so called mature devotee, however, commits a great offense by giving up the company of pure devotees. Yeah. So starting to listen to different literature and read things not related to devotional service, you know, and rather than hearing you know, devotional service in the association of devotees. Uh, slide 24. So human being is a social animal, and if one gives up the society of pure devotees, he must associate with non-devotees, asat sangha. By contacting non-devotees and engaging in non-devotional activities, a so-called mature devotee will fall victim to the mad elephant offense. Whatever growth has taken place is quickly uprooted by such an offense. <clears throat> wow. One should therefore be very careful to defend the creeper by fencing it in, that is, by following the regulative principles and associating with devotees, the pure devotees. Even if one thinks that there are many pseudo 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 devotees or non devotees in the Krishna consciousness society. Still one should stick to the society. If one thinks the society members are not pure devotees, one can keep direct company with the spiritual master. And if there is any doubt, one should consult the spiritual master. However, unless one follows the spiritual master's instructions concerning the regulative principles and chanting and hearing the holy name of the Lord, one cannot become a pure devotee. Uh, so there's a nice description of, in ISKCON because we, we're, we're involved with this, with people violently you know, critical of devotees in ISKCON and we're trying to deal with them and help them. They're all demons. They've all deviated. But here's a question. You know, are they following the regulative principles and chanting and hearing the holy name? Well, they're following four principles and chanting 16 rounds. But they're still demons. Well, it's kind of hard. We should take a very serious consideration about deciding a devotee is a demon if he's chanting all his rounds nicely and following the four principles strictly. Maybe he is. <laughs> but it should be a very serious consideration you know, before we start you know, giving up the association of people because it irritates our mind. Okay? One cannot become a pure devotee. By one's mental concoctions, one falls down. Oh, my goodness. If you're a psychologist, you know what this is called, what, uh, delusional complexes, delusional systems. And they develop like anything, you know. Uh, one devotee, specifically in San Francisco, he was taking LSD to chant his rounds. And, of course, the story is that Jayatirtha Prabhu was actually so soaking Tulsi leaves and LSD and then offering them a sandalwood paste with Sheila and then distributing them as Mahaprasadam and people would chant Japa with him and, and he would take them and they would be in ecstasy. They were experiencing paranormal states of consciousness because of his association. <laughs> really, they were tripping on LSD. Yeah. And so then what happens? Our mental concoction, we start to develop this idea, that idea, he said this, she said that, I think this, this is my group. And it takes work to keep these you know, systems going, to develop them, to look for evidence, you know, to find our citations, to find our friends. So this one devotee in uh, San Francisco, 
he actually developed this idea that he was an incarnation of uh, I think Arjuna. Yeah. And in, in his circle of associates, of devotees, you know, one of them was actually Bhima, and another was Yudhisthira. He was identifying them, you know, that he was going on like this over several weeks, months. And then one girl who he was attracted to, I uh, forgot her name, uh, she was actually Draupadi. And she was, all, she was hanging out that time with Guru Kripa Prabhu. And so Guru Kripa, he found out, he realized was Duryodhana. <laughs> like that. So as this would go on, he would, uh, he would like, uh, you know, with the devotees who were supposed to be Bhiman, who hadn't realized it yet, he, he, he would uh, just stand next to them and sometimes say, Bhima! Bhima! And they would kind of look at him and he would smile mysteriously, you know. So at one point he decided to rescue Draupadi from, uh, from Duryodhana and tried to pull her, out, pull her out of the temple and she started screaming and beating on him. And then Guru Kripa came over, who was Duryodhana, and started beating on him. <laughs> and so he, he ran away and couldn't figure out why Draupadi was beating on him. So a few days later he was uh, taking prasadam in the temple and Devotees were talking near him about how Jayatirtha was developing these, had developed these delusional systems and uh, on LSD and thought this and that and laughing. And he was hearing this and he was beginning to think, well, huh, that's interesting. Huh. <laughs> and so then he actually cut down on his LSD for a couple of days and realized he wasn't Arjuna and, you know, nobody was the girl and so on. Yeah. So it, it, we can see it. It goes like that. We develop a whole logical system. And people can tell us, oh, Prabhu, it's not like this and that. And we quote from this and that. We quote from the letters and probably letter to this person, probably letter to that person. And have a sometimes enormous, you know, delusional system, which makes us quite comfortable like that. By one's mental concoctions, one falls down. By associating with non-devotees, one breaks the regulative principles and is thereby lost. And Papa goes on to cite Upadeshamrita, text number two, like that. You know? So it's kind of our, uh, our whole, you know, humble presentation on this verse. And, of course, the actual text again here, you know, Lord Brahma is offering his obeisances and meditates upon Krishna, whose, in, in, whose, whose invincible potencies make less intelligent class of men think of him as a supreme controller, like that. You know? So we, we kind of got onto this about you know, ke- keeping, keeping Srila Prabhupada in the center, you know, the pure devotee, and understanding him properly and, and uh, appreciating that, yes, Prabhupada does empower different people. People do encou- empower all of us you know, become incarnations in some way of the potency of the parampara, like that, of Srila Prabhupada. But how to understand this properly is very important, you know. And if we keep association of pure devotees in ISKCON, devotees who are chanting, following, and, and probably will see my experience, that when these sectarian groups do develop in ISKCON and, and they really impede, and they keep Krishna from giving the mercy to a yatra, and they become prominent, you know, even subtly, you know, they cause difficulties. You know. Then uh, the people who are promoting it are not people who are following the regular principles. You know, 16 rounds, four principles, morning program, you know, some, looking for some sankirtan. And then automatically you're looking for friendship, help. And even though you're false amongst your devotees, you try and put friendship, you know, prominently. And the better, bu- better business bureau, their motto is, uh, start with trust. You know, before you start looking for all kinds of criticisms and cheating in business, well, I'll cheat him because he cheated me. You know, it's a very common phrase. Well, that's business. It's not business. It's robbery. <laughs> yeah. Before we get into that, we need this, you know, of being trustworthy. And so it takes education, chanting. See example of Narada Muni and how he got information about how to associate with devotees, the Pachetas. And then we can keep a very good uh, association of other pure devotees in ISKCON and be protected from our mental concoctions and have a very, very wholesome understanding of Srila Prabhupada. You know? and, and then at that time, 
you know, Krishna's blessings will, will come on us and we can really expand this mercy like anything. So that's our class here. And I've been talking loudly to try and, because our volume is supposed to be low, and I feel like a, a Baptist minister in Nashville, Tennessee. So brothers and sisters, if you have any comments or complaints or suggestions, please let us know. Hare Krishna. Okay, Maharaj. No, you sounded real good. I was talking loud, brother. It's the gospel loud. Well, it went through the heart. Anybody have anything they want to add? Hallelujah. <laughs> Just a thought. <clears throat> you were talking about if one begins to deviate, or if one begins to associate with the non-devotees, a satsang the tiag, and one begins to um, you know, deviate from the principles, etc., and he may develop this very d- delusional mentality of thinking, you know, I- I'm Bhima and you're Drona, etc. <laughs> well, it really isn't much different if one just starts thinking back, I'm Sam. If we're identifying, uh, you know, whether, we're, whether we're thinking Arjuna or we're just thinking I'm Sam, that's, that's in a sense equally as delusional because that's not us either. It's a very wonderful point. That's, that's, it's bad enough, isn't it? Bad enough to think we were, we were <laughs> where we were. My God. That's, wow, thank you very much. Wow. Yeah. And it's always, always coming. I, I've heard Prabhupada said, you know, I've been in sannyasi for many years. I, think I even saw him say it when, when video, video or something. Uh, but still, sometimes I think about my former wife, you know. My wife, if he said like that, my former life and my wife. And he said, this is natural. He said, but I don't go back. That's intelligence. You know? So it's, it's, it's a fact. Mm-hmm. None of these, always, always these memories, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. And sometimes I've noticed like when I was in Russia, you know, I, nobody spoke English. I was for, for only two or three weeks, you know in this kind of like psychological deprivation environment, traveling outside of Moscow, and everything, the wallpaper, the smells, the, the social standards, it was all back about 1955. And so I started having these flashbacks of when I was like six years old, eight years old, <laughs> my mother calling me and this happening, and it was just unbelievable. It was, you know, it was so deep. Uh, is, are, are these you know these other delusional personalities that we have, and again this lifetime, my goodness, but also some of the intense ones we're carrying for several lifetimes, you know, and, and they, they archetypal images of who we were and stuff like that, yeah. So it's amazing. So keeping the association of devotees it seems, it seems like wow, what's this? No, but it's just we have to be what's the word like you know surrounded. You know, it's the word bombarded, you know, bombarded by, by devotional consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Prophet gave that example many times of a, how easy it is to break a stick. When you pick uh, up another stick, you can break it easily, but when you bundle a bunch of sticks together, they can't be broken. In other words, the, 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 the total is a, is a greater amount of strength than, than the sum of all the individuals. Wow. You think of these big, I mean, with big ropes, you can pull. One time our bus was stuck in, this, in the sand, the guy brought a tractor over, and we, we tied a rope on and pulled the bus out. But it was a rope, and a rope is composed of nothing but strands of hair like that, isn't it? Tiny little strands of hair, mm. you know? Yeah. Mm. yeah another good, yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. Huh. One, That's right. Yeah. Any, and any little fiber... Every, any one of the little fibers you could break easily, but somehow when they're bound together, the, the strength is, is so much greater than the sum of the individuals. Wow. But bamboo has more compression strength per, per pound than steel. Mm. My, engineer, my engineer told me this. You know, more compression strength. You put pressure on the steel and buckle. Bamboo, bamboo can take it. Grass. Composed of fibers. Yeah. That's why, for me, these, these, these programs on, uh, on Friday here are, are so important for my, my whole balanced spiritual program, the association of all of your good selves. 
And now especially we're kind of alone here in some ways in Tennessee. So it's a small location. And, you know, it's a, it's a little bit peaceful in the sense that I can, I can really focus on stuff. You know, I don't have to have a lot of uh, people around, a lot of things happening, which is distracting in some ways. So it's, it's good in that sense, you know. But, but at the same time, too, then working out association by electronic media, by doing projects together. I think that's the, the main thing. You know, even if you don't, if you live away from devotees, but you're doing some project with some of the devotees, like you're getting something ready for Rathiatra, you know. And then when that's there, a little communication, a little association, and I'm going to meet that person this time, and if I haven't memorized my verses, or oh, I'll look bad, I'll feel bad. You know, that's even more important than physically being, you know, being together, is actually having projects, you know, that you're working on together. Like that, you know. All right. I sometimes think that, like, the, the Judds, the, like Judd Barat and different personalities, that um, I've noticed that when you talk to, to anyone, they have any, I call it an assumed context. They, whenever they say anything, that the Atmaban Manyate Jagat they Dick, push it on to you that they think you're just like them and they assume, like, how are you? A simple thing like that. If you, like uh, Judd Barad and King Lahugana, he found out that actually uh, Judd Barad doesn't think the same as he does as soon as he started talking. So if they if you don't say anything, they they just assume this context. And uh, it, so I sometimes wonder that the Judds they just didn't want to get involved with uh, that whole difference between the the regular context because they'd have to preach and then how much would you have to say before I mean that that King Rahugana how many times it was like chapter after chapter he kept saying could you say it again I don't understand what you're saying so I, I sometimes think that when you're you know, like okay pass the solo work but I mean uh, anything that they say they just bring this whole idea that they think you're on the same page and how to deal with it unless you're preaching, you may get the association of that context if they assume that you're the same as them. My, my friend, uh, when I was in college, actually, he, yeah, D- David Donenfield, very intelligent guy, and actually he became one of these guys, the Vipassion, the yoga guy, big leader. Anyway, uh, he told me when we were in college someplace, I guess we just come out, he said, you know, nine out of ten people are on weird trips. And if you want to communicate with them, you have to understand their basic insanity and start from there. And it's something that's stuck with me, stuck with me in life, you know, is this, yes, we're all nuts, you know, but then people really, when you get down to it and really talk to them, you've got to find out what it is their basic, you know, basic delusion is, you know, like that, you know. He, he, he became a... I became a devotee. I got involved in Krishna consciousness. I mean, you know, we're kind of going a little bit different ways, you know. So at some point, he picked me up at the temple. I think I wasn't, maybe I was initiated then. And we went off for a drive up to, you know, Marin County and stuff, and I was talking all about what I was doing, you know. And I was just ecstatic explaining Krishna consciousness and everything else and basically talking, and he was just listening. And nice guy, you know, pious. He was absorbing, absorbing, you know. And we got back to the temple, and he dropped me off after about maybe like, 45 minutes of this, I was just preaching Krishna consciousness to him. He was just listening, you know. And he, he, he said, he said, you know, I can't remember a single thing you said. He said, but I have no material desires now. <laughs> you, you destroyed all my desires. What am I going to do, you know. He was kind of laughing, you know. So, yeah, you know, hearing repeatedly over and over again. Consciousness means perspective. And the word bhava, you know, that, it means that, yeah. It's, it's, it's a change in perspective like that, yeah. Oof. I unmuted those of you on Skype because somebody was making noise. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Yeah. About other topics too here, because it's very, very specific, one specific verse out of a whole series of you know, of, of ideas that Lord Brahma is presenting.
I, I just wanted to clarify something. You know, you were uh, making reference to various sectarian religious groups, the major uh-huh. Abrahamic religions. You also I included uh, Confucius in there. But uh, that's uh, just moral codes, isn't it? Uh, uh, there's no divinity that's assigned to either Confucius or his philosophy, is it? I was talking with, because um, I'm yeah, reading a little bit, studying a little bit here and there, you know. Um, but, and I look at the BBC biography yeah. of Confucius. You know, but um, I asked Miguel Polo, who's a big professor in, uh, of Chinese philosophy we deal with him there. And he says, yeah, definitely. Definitely Confucius talks about, you know, transcendence, you know, like that, you know. So, like, you know, any, any really good moral and ethical code comes to the point of... Uh, you know, Brahman, you know, level like that, so on. And so, yeah, he said that definitely within Confucius, basically it's like that is this, you know, the, 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 you know, striving for immortality, you know, striving for eternity and, and things like that. And, and, and again, Walt Whitman, he said like, you know, life's a spiral. And so I, 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 going upward, but I see the same things again and again, you know, but each time higher, each time higher, you know. So he said, uh, life is a road. And he said, well, uh, where does it go? And he said, I don't know. Yeah. He said, but I know it goes someplace good. So that's Brahman. You know, yeah, you're, you're convinced. You're just, the details aren't, no Paramatma yet. The de- features aren't there. You know? But you're sure, yeah, life's good. And there's always something good that's going to happen. Just hold your breath and hang in there. And you know, have, you know, have a positive attitude. So that kind of transcendence, I think, is in, uh, in Confucius' teachings. That's interesting. Does anyone that you know of actually say that he is divine? Because like, certainly the emperor of Japan was supposed to be divine, uh, hailing from the sun god. Uh, well, anything the, about Confucius and Chinese tradition? Yeah, the whole... The whole well, when does it start? China, I guess, you know, it goes back. There's a so-and-so mythological red emperor or something who's like the first guy somewhere here and there. This is what, generally speaking, you know, you'll find in the histories. And after that, there was another dynasty, another dynasty. And uh, each dynasty was supposedly uh, existing because of the mandate of heaven, like that, you know. But if you get into what is heaven then it's very similar to the Vedic description. There's a Yamaraj. You know, the, the Nagas are the, uh, what do you call them, the, uh, the dragons. You know, very similar, you know, China and the cosmology and everything else, you know. And one of the greatest classics, Journey to the West, Sam Wukong, monkey and piggy, and everybody with a monk, are heading on the orders of the Thai Emperor uh, from, chi- from China to India. Because they have karma conda scriptures, basically what it is. How to get out of hell, how to get this benefit, how to get that, you know. But they haven't got jnana karma scriptures, you know, which is basically liberation from the cycle of samsara and all this kind of stuff and immortality. And so then they're going to go to, to see the Tathagata Buddha and uh, to get the higher scriptures, you know, so on. So it's like, like that. It's on the, on the fringe. And then you know, different people are considered to be, you know, Shakti Avesh, avatars of heaven, you know, so on. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you, Marish. Yeah. It is. It's a big world, actually. <laughs> a lot. And the thing, these, things, these things carry on. I mean, even, even when Mao Tsung took over and was trying to enforce, you know, the Darwinian evolutionary philosophy and, and you know, so on, he, he never got rid of a lot of the cultural things, you know, in this whole process, and you know, they kind of carried right through, you know, because people, human being, was one Mother Mena. She was like a almost one star shirt. She was in Russia. They had this competition for kids, you know, singing, singing, whatever, dancing. It's called Star Search in America. I think it was called. So she came in second place. In all of Russia, when she was like 14 years old, and uh, as she said, as she grew and she, as she grew up, she had a, had a, a little picture of Lenin. And every night she used to put him in a little bed and put a blanket on him like that. 
<laughs> and she would pray to him, you know, like that, you know. And Lenin, when they, uh, when he was in Red Square for functions, the, all the senators would pull the chariot, you know, like a Rathiatra, he would be seated on the chariot and they would pull it, you know. And of course, people would stand in line for hours to see his tomb, you know, his body and, and embalmed in nitrogen. As far as I know, his body is still there in the tomb. They didn't, you know, dump him in some grave someplace. But now there's not a single line. And people just kind of walk by. I saw one tourist in shorts, you know, re- reading the sign. Here's where Lenin's body is. and gave a couple licks on his ice cream cone and continued on, you know, like that. You know? But this, this, this human being is in that. It's such an innate thing, you know, to, to worship like that, you know. Kind of like uh, the Lord Brahma of the former Soviet Union. Yeah, the Lord Jagannath, <laughs> Rafi Ashtakar. They must have had songs about him. Okay. But okay, I guess we should get off the line here. We're, 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 I just discovered a way to drop our, our AT&T bill $100 a month, you know, and everything else. So we should be able to be okay in the future. Uh, but right now, I think we're still getting charged maybe 45 cents a minute or something like that, so... Wow. wow. If I go over, if I go over, so I'm going to cut, cut the minutes off here. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj, and all the assembled devotees. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Narada Muni, who's spreading the glories of the Lord all over the universe. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Maharaj. Adi